to you, Ron. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope all, I'm sorry to say that we're still virtual. I never expected this to happen this way, but uh, it kind of has. Um, so zero trust is an interesting topic. Um, we, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time on it. You hear it, hear kind of the buzzword, but there's, what I'm going to try to talk about is, is talk about, um, actually, uh, there's a person, the godfather, I actually met him personally, John Kinderweg, and uh, a gentleman by the name of Chase Cunningham uh, uh, in Chicago recently, just last week. And I had this, it was great to speak to the person that actually came up with this topic. Um, I, uh, I'm being, being an educator on top of having a full-time job, um, I'm used to um, uh, communicating messages and I'm try, I'll am try. i try to be as clear as possible. Um, purpose for this, as you all know, we do have a cyber war going on, whether you like it or not. I mean, we don't all like this. Um, you know, we're kind of forced to uh, go out there and change a lot of things that, you know, we, we've all at, at the sea levels get in some situations where we're not really sure of what's really going on. And, you know, they might have a ton of security applications running at the same time. Everything's been implemented. It's all been out of your control. So I'm going to share uh, some interesting things with you in, in this methodology, and uh, hopefully you get a lot out of this. As you all know, the White House, uh, President Biden put a, issued an executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. Why I have this up here is to show you that on the next slide here is that if you look in here in section three, the federal government must adopt best secure, security best practices advanced towards zero trust architecture. And I won't read the rest of this. You can read it on the screen. But just so you know, um, John Kinderbeck has actually been, have it, had an influence. And so has Chase Cunningham. She's kind of an ex-Navy guy. I'm doing a lot of press for them because they were kind enough to share this information with me uh, personally. And uh, I think it's, it's valuable that we understand this. Um, so get a little bit of background on this. I, Kinderbeck himself, before he came with Jill or Trust, he spent about two years researching this concept before writing the first paper. He spent about six years um, extending the concept. So he spent about eight, eight and a half years or so at Forrester Research doing this. He decided he took a risk and said, okay, I don't like the way this is going with this. So then I decided to branch out and go to Palo Alto Networks, proving the concept and the design. So he actually not only just came up with the concept and the methodology, but also put it in action, spent the next four years doing this. Um, the interesting thing is, is that what he found out, um, is, as we all know, complexity increases your risk. Um, our technology is complicated right now, um, and the more complexity creates more vulnerabilities. And as we know, um, our cars, <laughs> I mean, our dishwashers are connected. Coffee pots can become connected. Uh, you know, we got IoT. Yeah, our cars are more complicated than they've ever been. I mean, there's 3,000 microchips and electricity in an electric car, which is kind of fascinating when you think about it. And that's why we're having a shortage of chips and they want us to go uh, migrate to that. But our, a lot of these things become very complicated. So, so, we, um, so we have to come up with a trust, right? We have to trust things. We all trust that when we get in the car, it's going to start. We also trust that when we get to work, a computer's going to come up and we know that they may not start off that way. So I want to cover some of the concepts of zero trust, all right? All resources are accessed in a secure manner, regardless of the location. Some of these things are very obvious to you, but I figured I'd cover them anyway. Access controls on a need to know basis. As we know, you know, all, you know, we've done perimeter defense and, you know, I'll do a sports analogy with it where, you know, sometimes man to man coverage doesn't work. Sometimes you have to, I mean, zone coverage doesn't work. Man to man coverage actually is much better. So, you know, we've given people access on the inside to information, and I'm going to cover that in a little bit, um, about the different uh, ways people have access to things they shouldn't have access to. Um, all traffic is inspected and logged. I mean, it's the first thing you do when you've been ransomware is they check, the obviously, the logs on the servers. The networks is designed from the inside out. Uh, believe it or not, um, the military actually designs their defenses from the inside out, not from the outside in. That's, that's pretty fascinating in itself. And the network is designed to verify everything and never trust. Obviously, trust then verifies where it started, but now we have to verify everything. Now, I 
I'm in my own job here because it's a 24 seven detention facility in addition to a court. Um, we, cause it's the majority of our work. We, what we do is, is I have physical access to the building. Now with physical access to the building, I mean, I can see whoever scan, we, we partition off, segment off different parts where you can't get access to. So I can, I know at any given point in time, or my staff knows that who, who uh, came in that door, who came out of it. Plus you got video surveillance that shows actually who came in and out that door. So if there's an incident, you can see that. And that's really when, where you wanna to get to on the, on the uh, computer side. You really wanna know who was there and how they've been there and why they've been there. You know, what are they looking at? I mean, it's a lot, it's a big job. I mean, it, it is there on a physical security side, but on a cyber side, it's a little bit light. Now here's what authentic zero trust is. It's a strategy designed to stop data breaches and other cyber attacks. Now, what resonates with C -lo, you know, with CEO, COO, CFOs, right? It's like stop data breaches. That's what they understand. That's what they they know. I mean, when your information gets locked down, then you don't get access to it. And then he's, I mean, there was a there was a hospital based outside of Indianapolis. The CEO kept getting notifications constantly on you know, uh, companies that were getting their information, their data was being breached. They, the systems were locked down. He says, well, I feel sorry for him, but, you know, we should be okay until it happened to him. And all of a sudden he realized, oh my God, I can't run paperless. I, I can't run without, I can't, I can't run without that uh, paper. I can't run on a paper-based environment. I can't believe it. So he just gave in. And, uh, you know, some of the things that, so they, so C-level executives tend, tend to, are starting to understand and the boards are becoming aware of how to stop stop the data breach okay it leverages design principles proven to work over more than a decade okay so as i gave you the kindervag story on how he started it um he put a 10 years into it okay just at four you know it based well more than that but eight years alone at forrester and then four years actually actually applying it and overseeing it so it works it uses a standard five-step methodology for implementing a zero trust architecture okay it's a methodology Okay. It provides demonstrable positive security outcomes for companies who adopt zero trust. Now we all know it's a very difficult challenge. Okay. It's very hard. It's not that easy because you have to start digging into things that haven't been dug into. And of course, we all know we have legacy applications. They generate the revenue for us, right? For the companies. And they're really hard to get rid of. It's going to take time for this, but you know, you still have to keep your business running. You have to understand that, but you also have to secure it. Now here's some zero trust misconceptions. Now that you kind of got a familiarity for, you know, what it's all about, and you probably, all, some of you have probably heard this before, but here's some misconceptions that are out there. Listen to this statement. Zero trust means making a system trusted. Hmm, interesting. Actually, no, it's not making a system trusted. That's false, okay? Because you'll have, you'll have identity access management providers, you know, privilege access management providers telling you that that's, They'll, they'll take the, there's actually a zero trust for dummies and they've, they've uh, changed it to, to actually cover, you know, toward, you know, they've guided it towards privilege access management. Well, obviously that's the first step, but that's not all of it. Zero trust is about identity. No, that's not true. It's not just about identity, right? It's not. Zero trust, there are zero trust products. No, there really isn't. There's other products that actually help the zero trust framework, but that's what it is. There's not a product you can buy off the shelf and that's gonna be zero trust. Zero trust is complicated. Now, um, me being in this role for five years, I could tell you, actually, that's what I was thinking. I thought zero trust, yeah, this is complicated. I don't even know where half this stuff's at. I have no documentation that exists for a lot of things. I got into this thing, I have no. So it, yes, it, but that's not true. The zero trust is not complicated. It's very simple. And hopefully as I go along here, you'll start to think, well, okay, well, it's not as bad as I thought it is, but it can, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of marketing. You're going to have marketing. That's just how it is. They're going to try to market products. So you can have say, I mean, my inbox is full constantly with vendors trying to, you know, push their product, rightly so. They're at least trying to create awareness for me, but at the same token, I'm not at that stage yet. So it's some, you know, but that's just part of it. At least they're generating some awareness for you, but it's not complicated. Okay. And I hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll feel like it's not that complicated. So I tried my best 
to take all this information and make it as clear as possible for you. Now, there's four levels of strategic engagement, right? When you do any kind of planning, there's the grand strategy, okay, which is your ultimate goal. There's the strategy, which is the big idea, right? Then you've got tactics, which is the things that you use, right? And most of the vendors are focusing on the tactical part of it. That's what I mentioned before. They're telling you things that you can use to do this, but the thing is you have to have your strategy in place before you do that. And of course the operations part of it, which is the way you use them, right? So we have, we have start at the high level and work our way out down to the operational level. And as we know, policy is one of the biggest parts, biggest, biggest obstacles that we, that we face, that we have to change. So if we go to our grand strategy and if we take this and view it as a level of cyber war, let's look at the grand strategy of the actual cyber war. What's the strategy? Stop data breaches. Very simple. Boards tend to understand that. Um, you know, as tech, as uh, IT people, I, I was started my career at the business side. So I went to the IT side because, I mean, people could understand it. I mean, and I could tell you that you have to, and I'm going to go through this in a little bit, but you have to understand that people have to understand what you're saying. We all know a lot of the technical things you know, up to some degree. We learn every day and we get better every day, right? But you have to explain it so people can understand it, especially C-level executives. Those guys are the C level, the CEOs, the CFOs, COOs, and, the, and CIOs. A lot of us report to a CIO in my situation. I'm smaller, so I'm basically doing both roles. But in a in a in a grand scale, you know, they they've they, they've achieved a lot in their careers, and of course, they've been looked to as the you know the person that knows all. And as we know, sometimes you don't know all that, but and we all have to contend with that, right? But you got to understand that. You're, you're where the experts coming in for those CISOs and, and uh, CTOs and CIOs. We're the experts and they're relying on us to do this. And we, we have to be in a position where we can communicate this information to them so that they understand it clearly. And yeah, they're going to think like they know it and you know that they don't. But there's a lot of things we don't know on the business side that they know that they're experts at. I mean, they know they know things, you know, how to deal with uh, profitability and, and things of that nature that we're not, our expertise may or may not be there. So we kind of have to work together as a team to do that. So our strategy is going to be zero trust, right? So the tactics that we're going to use different tools and techniques, as you know, to some tools and techniques don't work like they're supposed to. And that's, that's a learning process, right? I mean, you see like many in manufacturing, you see cars get built better. You know, Tesla's had a lot of quality control issues. An example, there's different tools that you use and techniques and some things are not working. Operations, there's platform and policies, right? And we all know we're driven by policies. So a lot of these policies have been outdated. And a lot of things I find funny is that you'll ask people like, why are you doing it this way? Well, we've done it this way the whole time. Well, why do you do it? Well, I don't know. Somebody else told me and that the whole training part of that becomes very, becomes an obstacle for us as IT professionals and cybersecurity professionals because Hey, you know, I mean, nobody wants to be questioned. You know, I should have access to anything. Well, it's not necessarily the case. You know, before, if we had paper files, you couldn't see certain things, right? We forget that. I mean, if you look at even in the past, so like EDI, um, a lot of that data, you couldn't figure out for the life of you. Like what, what information was being transmitted, it was coded. But then we went to newer technologies and became put it more in English terms. Well, I think that's sometimes to our detriment. So let's start, start with the grand strategy, stop data breaches, right? What does that entail? Well, when did it start? If you look here, remember from the Wall Street Journal, Target was hit by the credit card breach, okay? It was over Black Friday based on, uh, you know, back in December of 2013. This is when cybersecurity, be, we became a lot of awareness. You know, Target, you know, th those, those swipe card machines, they've been in there for a long time. They worked. They were never secure. They were never designed secure to start with. So, of course, you know, somebody had the grand idea, let's go in there and go, go where the least vulnerable, you know, the low-hanging fruit was. Well, that's where they went. I mean, because the credit card companies had some experience in the past with this, the credit card companies spent, didn't want to spend extra money on a secure, you notice now you have the, uh, the smart cards, you know, built into your credit card, you know, that's what they use in the cell phones. You know, there's three levels of security built in there. So that was pretty much a the thing, but they never wanted to go to that because it was inexpensive 
to use a swipe card. So what do you think they're going to do? It's kind of the cost factor. It doesn't become like where it makes sense or not. This is where it all started. So 20, since 2013, it's been going at a speed I never knew that it would be at. But So another strategy is going to be zero trust. Now, here's where we get in the meat and potatoes of it, right? What is it? Trust. Now, trust is an interesting term, right? I don't know how, and I, Kirk, um, Kinderveg brought this uh, to light too, is, and I can't understand, trust is a human emotion, right? We trust people, we trust instinct, there's, there's trust involved. You have that gut feeling, right? You even do it on an interview. If you're not feeling it right, yeah, this isn't working for me. Everything that you do is, that's a human emotion. You can't put it, I didn't ever know systems to have emotions. Not in my lifetime. I, and I'm not a data bit and zeros and ones. I mean, I, I have a name. I have an identity. I have a physical appearance. I'm not. So trust is, is it, I don't know how this happened either. I don't understand. It's a dangerous vulnerability that is exploited by malicious actors. We all know that there's a lot of social engineering going on. It's been going on for quite a while. I mean, they started it with the telephone. You probably get calls from your parents and your grandparents. I know I do. Hey, Ron, you know, guess what? Uh, you know, I have this guy that just called me and told me my computer's generating viruses. I'd be like, okay, is your computer on? Nope. <laughs> I go, well, how can it be generating viruses, Ma? Okay. All right. So they finally get it, but they get they get taken advantage of. I mean, people read the books and people that, you know, you get the FBI has written that, you know, have written books on how to social engineer people, how to get things out of people, you know, if you're nice to them, uh, I mean, they try different ways to get in. A lot of times, you know, they, people are careless with their passwords or you got disgruntled employees that, you know, aren't happy at their organization anymore. Look at me. So, yeah, you know, we have a lot of basis to cover as security professionals. So I'm going to show here, um, you know, you're looking at the big horse here. Like, what the heck is Ron putting up on a slide here? Well, guess what? The fall of Troy was in 1184 BC. The Greeks couldn't get into Troy because of the perimeter security. Does that sound familiar to you? I says, what are we doing here? We're doing perimeter security, right? It didn't work. So what did they do? They put the Trojan horse in there and they came out and they defeated the city of Troy. So, so if you look in history, it's all there that perimeter security really doesn't work. All right. So I just thought it was quite fascinating. You know, and the, of course the Trojan horse, you know, we all heard about Trojans and malicious malware. Okay. Started back here. And unfortunately, we can't, we haven't figured it out yet, which is kind of embarrassing, actually. So here we go. Which one goes to the internet? Traditional, the moat and cat, what they call the moat and castle approach. And that's what Troy did. You know, you put the moat there, you, have, you know, hopefully it'll stop people from coming over into the castle. So we've got the untrusted and trusted part of the network, right? You got the internet out there. It's the untrusted variable. But guess what? The internal network there, you got malicious insiders, okay? It's trusted. Okay, if you look at two most recent individuals, you got Snowden and Manning. Okay, why did Snowden have access to, to secure documents you should have never had access to? How does that happen? Well, because guess what? You, we screened you. We've done a background track on you. We found you as an, you know, you're, you're a great employee. And, and guess what? We're going to trust you with all our data and you can get access to it. And so on. And nobody's monitoring you. Okay, uh, we don't know. We just, and guess what? You brought your own device. You're on the network. Uh, I don't know what you're doing, but it seems to be okay. We're running. All the systems are running. We're making money. Right? So if we go to the zero trust approach, guess what? People are not packets. If you look here, you got the untrusted, untrusted on the outside, untrusted on the inside. Okay, so really, I mean, you know, we know all those employees we're going to try to get access to what everybody else is making, right? If you can get access to the HR database, you're in there because you're, because you're going to look and say, well, how, how does that piece make more than me? We all know it. It's just human nature. People are just going to explore. So you have to, you can only, they, you have to, you have to set it up. So, Hey, let's be reasonable about this. You're in financial, you get access to certain information. You're not going to get access to the HR database, right? It's just the way it is. You'd like to, because you want to see how much the CEO is making, right? So there's now that now we hit the tactics, right? What are some of the tools and techniques, right? We go back to the design concepts. We focus on the business outcomes, right? What's what what is going to make money? What's going to make people a buy our product? Um, what's going to generate revenue for us? So what are we good at? We're going to design it from the inside out, okay? Not from the outside in. 
just like the military does. Determine who and what's determine who or what needs access. Now, the what means obviously machines doing it, but what access do you need? I mean, before, if you remember with EDI, it was one to one communications. I mean, you would just set up a straight dedicated line and then you'd have a communication back with that vendor. So you knew that vendor was on, the only one that had access to the data going back and forth, right? You know, especially for payment processing systems. So here we want to determine who and what needs access. And then you can want to inspect and log all traffic, right? So you just want to see who's coming and who's going. So it kind of makes sense, but you realize it's a big job. We're all understaffed. We can't find the right people. You know, there's a shortage of all the qualified people out there. We all want to find the best people to do this, but it does take time, okay? And it does take the university's time from a university's perspective. It takes them time to generate the right employees. There's always been a disconnect between academia and corporate America because we're trying to do the business part of it and academia still focus on the basics and the ones don't necessarily tie hand in hand. We'd like to have a uh, an employee that comes out turnkey that can start, you know, hit the ground running. But as you know, in sports, that doesn't necessarily happen either. So we have to be able to inspect everything. So does this make sense to everyone? Focus on the business, design it from the inside out, who and what needs access and expect all the traffic. So basically that's a layer seven policy on the OSI model. So what, here's one of the things that kind of puts it all together. I don't know if you've, you've seen the president's motorcade. This is the beast right here. And you have four secret service around here. You also have perimeter here. So I'm gonna kind of go through here. This, this, see the four people that surround the president's, uh, the beast there, they know one, who the president is. They know where the president is. They also know who should have had access to the president. Does that sound a little familiar with what zero trust is, right? So look at this. Now we got, there's the perimeter. There's the perimeter. So you have the police officers looking at all those people in the actual um, outside. They're looking for suspicious characters, right? Then you have, then you have the protect surface, which is what Zeratrust says. Here's your protect surface. Here's your micro perimeter, you know, between the perimeter. So you have different controls, right? So they all know what's going on here. You try to go take a run that trying to wave hi to the president or try to do a selfie. Uh, actually, by the way, uh, they try to do that with JLo and of course, uh, Ben Affleck tried to defend her so, uh, recently. So you have that micro perimeter and protect surface and the controls there in place so that they know to keep the president safe and his family, right? They know that the president should be there, the family, his, his wife should be there and the two children should be in that car. So if you look here, now you got four guys doing the monitoring there in addition to your perimeter scanner so that they know what's going on. Um, believe it or not, according to John Kinderbag, he had some input into this and how they would set this up. So this methodology works just now for computer systems, but also physical security. So zero trust, right? So does that make sense? I, I thought that this picture really gives a snapshot of what zero trust is in a nutshell. Um, and that's what you're gonna try to do. Okay, now your journey. Here's your first step. Now, I thought this was a real interesting slide because of Floyd Stairs in Norway. They developed this in the 20s, and there's 4,444 steps to the top. And I assure you, I think working for government, I'm at 4,500 steps to the top. Um, but what shows is, is that you get there step by step. Okay, you start with the first step, you're going to make some mistakes, you're going to find out what's going on. And the thing is, is that that's okay, all right? So I just thought this is interesting. This is a tough challenge up here. I don't know if I could do it because I have a fear of heights, believe it or not, but it's actually um, just showing you that it can be done and you can make it to the top. Okay, the, the five-step methodology, as I talked to you before, deploying zero trust, it's gonna guide your journey, okay? So we'll start here. Define the protect surface as I showed in the example of physical security for the present. The protect surface was the beast and the four people around them. So that's your protect service. What that is, there's an acronym with it. DAS. So you're going to, the, your data, obviously that's one of your crown jewels, protect the data, protect your applications, protect your assets, and protect your services, right? So your data applications, so you're going to define what your data, data is, the applications are, the assets, and the services, right? So it's good to map this stuff out. So here's, so we're going to the next step. Then you map the transaction flows. How, do, how does information flow? 
you know, you've got vendors out there that have access to your systems. Now, how's the from what information are they getting? What information flows to there? How does it get there? How does it come back? Where do the feeds come back? You know, obviously, Melissa Shatcher tries to get in there. It's like the Trojan horse from, yeah, yeah, yeah. They get it in there and then they, they sit in there and they sit in the network. Uh, it's another CISO that I talked to that, that um, just, they just caught somebody and they caught them in the inside perimeter there. I mean, uh, and so they're, they're trying to, they're just trying to knock him out, but to find out where he came from, but they kind of locked it down. So you can't, so they stopped the flow out of the network. So you just want to map where the transaction goes. It's good to have a map. Um, architect is zero trust environment. So once you know what you protect, what you need to protect, with the DAS model, map the transaction flows. And then you got it. And then you're gonna create a policy, which is one of the most difficult parts, right? Policy, we've been, all the companies are driven by policy. So it's hard to do. And I can tell you from a government environment, we've got policies in here that are, I don't understand some of them, so I try. And then you're gonna monitor and maintain, right? So this is your simple five-step methodology for de deploying it. So does that sound like it's complicated? I really don't think so. Um, it is because you don't really know what you're navigating, what you're getting into, what's going on. It's gonna take some time. And your board has to understand it's gonna take you some time to do it. It's not gonna happen overnight. We'll do the best we can, but there's a lot of stuff out there. I have no control. I have no idea. You know, there, there's people that were, I, I'm sure some of you have experience where the person that was working there has gone three months later and then all of a sudden you're the guy on the top and have to make all the decisions and you have no idea. Okay. So it's, this is where you need a partner to do this. We can't all do it ourselves. It applies to a lot of different things. So zero trust does define network segmentation and I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, talking on the technology side, but here's your protect surface. Okay. And you gotta, you gotta ask yourself why you're segmenting this out. Okay. And then what you're gonna do that, you got your segmentation, your segmentation gateway. And I'm just gonna keep clipping through on how are you enforcing your segmentation at the layers two through seven. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the technical side. So understand, I'm just trying to give you a, a pictorial of how physically it's going to look. And then you see here, you got the switches and the gateways hypervisors and the workload. And, and then what you're going to do is you extend zero trust to public and private clouds. Okay. Obviously, as you know, uh, you know, getting rid of some of the legacy systems are going to be difficult because of the bread and butter, but you will eventually do it. But in the meantime, you want to make sure you have a zero trust policy in place and the framework so that when you do go to better systems, you know, that they're, they're more robust, um, you can make that transition uh, safely and effectively and not lose business at the same time, okay? Uh, so I'm just kind of clicking through the, uh, the virtual system, VSG, the high, you know, so you see how it all works. This is the, the, you know, the networking side and how you can build it, okay? And then you got the different APIs. So we went for, so we're on now to the operations part of it, the platform and the policies. Okay, and that's where I talk about the zero trust learning curve, right? We have the sensitivity, so criticality of protect of the protect surface, right on your left. And you have your time and your zero trust journey. So what you're gonna do? Here's how it works. You know, interesting. It's not a full bell shaped curve, right? Those of you remember from stats days. Um, there's your learning cycle. There's your different. You're gonna learn about your protect surfaces. What you got to do, right? Then you're going to get to the practice part of it where you're going to learn, right? And then you're going to get to where you're protecting your crown jewels, which is your systems that are your bread and butter, right? Making sure that you can make the systems that make you money, that makes the company function. You know, obviously your, 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 your payroll systems, your financial systems, uh, your interaction, you know, whether it be, you know, your uh, ordering systems, your actual, you know, web-based, uh, if, you, if you're uh, internet, you know, if you're, you got a web or if you have physical storefronts, you know, all those kinds of things come into play. And then you're going to, um, you're going to hit your, um, your secondary systems and then your territory, you know, not as main systems, but this is kind of the learning curve and the approach. So, you know, it just, it's going to take you time. So don't think that it's not. And I, we all under time crutch not to get a breach. You know, you got different industries that are concerned about 
from healthcare, you know, obviously nobody wants their private data breached. I mean, you had the Sony breach a long time ago where executives, some, uh, you know, the vice president was, was uh, interested to find out that the company was tracking he has a, a special needs child. And how did they have access to all that information? So um, you're going to find out those things um, and you're going to spend a lot of time doing it now. Uh, you're going to look at now this next slide. I just thought about what if only a machine can defeat another machine. If, you, if the imitation game, if anybody saw that, it's based in 2014 about the mathematician. He's the guy that uh, cracked the Enigma machine that the Germans had. They didn't know that we cracked it, right? So he used the machine to, he used the machine to do it. I uh, went through a lot of trials and tribulation of it, but it's basically what it's going to be. You know, we're not, we're only human, but we're going to have to have machines that are going to be able to uh, defeat the other machines. So something to think about. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do now is talk, you know, I talk a little bit, you know, I kind of went through the concepts to hopefully understand how this works. Okay. And how, how, um, how this, uh, they don't know some of the things, you know, it's just the executive management board level. You, you got to, as I've learned um, and it's taught me in teaching is that you just kind of expect people read the material and they know um, they don't. All right. They don't know. And you got to understand that you may know and they don't, and you got to kind of find a way to do it. And for, so as security leaders, I've said this before, as you know, a C, I mean, they know as technology professionals, there's a lot of education that goes into it, right? You're kind of like the doctor, uh, essentially. They don't understand anything of what you do. They don't understand all technology. They could barely get their iPhone to work right. And they can barely get their, you know, it's just, I had a conversation with a Corvette dealer. I'm in the fast cars, but, and I asked one of the, the Corvette technician, they spent a lot of time. He's like the best in the area. He's the go-to guy for, for, you know, he, they sent him to the track because the Corvette's a track car. So guess what? And I asked him interesting question. I says, well, what are the, what do people tend to ask you? You know, like, you know, you know what, how the car handles on the track, you know, the specifics of it. So how the heck, what do they ask? He goes, the most question they ask me is how to pair my, my contacts of my phone into my car and it drops my connection to my phone in my Corvette. And I almost, I split my side laughing so hard. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So they send you all this training, you know, how to fix the car, how to have, you know, teach them how to handle on a track. And they ask, well, how can I, how can I seek my contacts? I go, so, so the, so the automotive technician is now a person that shows them how to connect link his contacts and it connect his boots is amazing. So you do have to speak business. Okay. I know we like to fall back on as technicians, I mean, the CEO is going to, especially if you don't do a good job of it, you know, if he's going to see you coming down the hall and says, oh my God, it's, I know he's coming at me. It's going to cost me money. And oh my, that's it. You go talk to him, your turn. You know, so you don't want to get to that point. You got to build some trust. Data breach is the only IT event will get a CEO or company president fired. Hence the grand strategy, right? It's, it's the only one that's going to get him because you've seen in some instances where CEO took the hit, right? Other stuff, they'll kind of let it go. Well, you know, something you can control. But you got to protect the information. You also have to tell the board, tell your executive team that it's not an inhibitor. Cybersecurity is not an inhibitor. You know what? The, if your DevOps team, they're telling you, I can't put the security in and stuff like that. It's too hard to do this. I can't test it out. I'm trying to get the product to market. Guess what? Frozen systems due to ransomware is the inhibitor. If your systems are shut down, guess what? It's not, you're going to inhibit your business anyway. So it's an, so you got to just come to some kind of, that's why you all have to work. We all have to work as a team to make it happen. These, I don't like these, these bad actors. I mean, they're making easy money. I mean, think about it. They're making more than the money that I'm going to make in a lifetime. All right. Kind of disappointing to me. Now, I know you'll probably want to ask me a question about cybersecurity budgets. Um, if you only budget like five to ten percent, you probably aren't doing enough. So something you have to realize. But there are cheaper alternatives coming out there that are cloud-based. So maybe that might be that you might be strong enough. But um, just kind of take a look at these things. We all know that you know there's going to be obstacles, and you know, in an ideal situation, the CISO should report to the CEO um, because it's because obviously it's a big thing if they had to put a 
Biden had to put an executive order for it. Now it's taken out. You know, they, they call the big tech companies in. They're putting billions into cybersecurity. So, um, but just these are some tips that I think I, I know are helpful. I realize that it may not have where the CISA reports to the CEO, CEO, but, and, you know, put some, you know, suggest something about rewarding your teams for doing a good job, you know, get, put some rewards in place, you know, have them spend time with you. Um, you know, they spend a lot of time with the compensation committee because it's direct to the bottom line, right? People are the most, uh, most of the costs involved in an organization, right? So have them spend a little more time with you with this stuff. I mean, you know, reward, they should put, put incentive plans in a pay, place that they, they help, you know, that you feel, you know, that for people going in there and, and fixing the things and give, you know, communicate to your C-level team that, hey, look, this does take time. You know, I wish I, I had all the answers. I know with myself, it's like when somebody has a crisis with everything, they, they come to me, they overshoot my staff and they say, they're in this crisis mode. And they're like, hey, look, you know, I, I need to know what you're doing. You know, they, I build trust, okay? So you just have to have them communicate. You have to build a communication. You have to build, this is where the human emotion shouldn't be in there. The human emotion involves people. So just build a trust with your executive team and say, hey, look, you know, this isn't that easy. You may think I know a lot of things, but I'm telling you, I don't know everything. I mean, I try, I'd like to know everything. Believe me, I like to put a stop to all of it because I like to take the money that they're taking. You know, I come and ask for a million dollars. We all seen the meme out there. And then all of a sudden, all they, you know, and then, they cyber, you know, they ransomware us and you're paying 10 million. How do you think I feel? I'll go with you for one and you pay them 10. <laughs> think about it from my angle. So anyway, I hope this was helpful for you. Um, and I, and like I say, I like, like to give a little bit of uh, background on zero trust. I hope you understand there was a lot of time put into this. I'm not the godfather of it. John Kinderbeg is, I don't take credit for it, but I just want to say thank you for allowing me to try to show you something and I hope you got a lot out of this. Okay, well, thank you, Ron. We do have a couple of questions out here, or questions and comments. Jason okay. said, I brought my military days with me into the private sector. I speak to them on at an eighth grade level. So that's more of a comment. Yes, that's know. good. And then I have, uh, hold on, Raju says, is there any consideration of risk in the strategy? Yes, there is. Um, risk. Uh, obviously complexity increases risk, right? Okay, so if you understand that, we wanna make these networks as simple as possible, okay? So you wanna make it so that you can, by identifying, we're, we're limiting risk, right? If we you know, figure out where the protect surface is at, you're gonna minimize your risk, right? We all, it's like when I, when I show the example, of protecting the president, I know who he is, I know who I'm supposed to protect and where he's at, right? So I hope that answers your question for you. But you have to make sure that you got to be able to answer those questions. You know, who's accessing data? And think about the T-Mobile break-in that recently happened. I used to work for them. Okay. I can tell you that their systems themselves, I mean, they're socially engineered all the time because people want, obviously people want uh, the latest and greatest devices. So they're going to figure out a way how to get them. But, um, you know, they have a lot of data in there. And I think that um, the risk involved is, is that if you're no longer a customer, why is a company any company hanging on to your data. You know, we haven't as consumers, you know, asked the question, hey, look, why should you get this? But there's there's a huge risk involved in this model with, hang, you know, knowing what data that you're hanging on to and stuff that you won't. I mean, in the from what I've read, as far as the team will break, as much as they were released, because I'm not on the inside, I mean, they accessed uh, information, uh, text files off a of backup drive, okay? Now, really, I mean, they say they didn't get my financial information, but I, uh, they got it. I mean, I, you know, why do you, so risk is inherent in the model itself. You have, you're, you're going to, you're going to reduce risk, but you, you want to decrease the complexity. If you have 45 different applications running for security on your system, how is that not, how is that not creating a risk for you? How do you know that that system is not, that those things were set up properly? I found and my own situations here with my teams is that some things just weren't set up right. I mean, we all know as we have to outsource more, you know, people make mistakes just the way it is. I hope that, I hope that answers your question. I was a little bit of a tangent there, but it does <laughs> hope it helps. Okay. 
Well, I also, Raju said, does it appear the policy could be a single point of failure as it drives everything? Any advice on how to overcome this? Well, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I have, being in the government sector, um, we actually had, because we went to uh, a lot more e-filing, um, you know, it's created easier for people to, to file with the courts and then get their information in because some people can't afford attorneys, right? Um, we have, you have to sit down and those are going to, you're going to have to form a committee uh, and I, and you're going to have to sit down and, and have, re-review that policy and get the decision makers in place. Cause what I did is I actually got the judges in place and asked, why is this, why are we doing it this way? Right. I mean, it was, it's a painful process. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable, but you have to, you, you just got to be honest about it. And we're all on the same team. And this is what you have to review the policy and understand if it makes any sense. We are all inhibited by policy and no, people don't like to change. I can tell you right now, people don't like to change. I teach, I've been teaching students for over 10, 11 years now. I can tell you, people don't read. <laughs> I try to teach them to read something. You always have to, you know, people don't read past the page. So you have to understand, but it, it does, you have to ask the question. You have to bring the policy to light. You have to say, Hey, look, this is the way we're doing it right now. Does it make sense? And come to consensus. Jason said most of the time the sea levels don't know, or at least don't remember the stuff in the weeds. So yeah, uh, that, that's very true. That's a very true comment. No, they don't know. And they're going to forget because their priorities are different. And then um, I have, is it time to standardize the trust based on the consistency factual information with approved and acceptable evidence. That's correct. I agree with that statement. And um, I have a lot of great presentation. Thanks for the presentation. Um, great presentation. I think I got most of them. Let me see um, if I've missed anything else. Okay. Um, so for every, everybody out there, if there's any other questions, Ron is going to be sitting on the panel as well. And if you do go up to the network lounge, you can ping him in the network lounge and that will direct message him if you have any questions, any additional questions. Because generally once the conversation gets going and we wrap this up, more questions come in and there's a little bit of a delay, but let me well, just check over here. And okay. make sure I'm not seeing any other Please. questions. Is there, do you want to let um, Ron people know how they can get in touch with you and the west, best way? Sure. Sure. The best way to, um, to get in touch with me, if you do have a question, I'll, I'll give you my uh, email address is rzochals at iu.edu. That's my university address that I use. Um, because, you know, I get an influx of emails on my work email. So if you have anything that you'd like, like some clarification on or just kind of bounce an idea off of, I'd be more than happy to uh, try to get back to you. Enough. it's not for a few days, it's nothing personal. <laughs> it's just some days I'm more overwhelmed than others like the rest of you. Well, thank you so much, um, Ron. Again, tons of comments over there about a, what a great presentation that was.